Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very happy to bring my conversation with David Peña Guzman. Uh, David has his PhD in philosophy from Emory University. He has done a postdoc at the Center for Evolutionary Ecology and Ethical Conservation. And he's also done work at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics in Baltimore, Maryland. His main interests are in the history and philosophy of science, animal studies, feminist philosophy, bioethics, and social theory. And he is the author of the new book, When Animals Dream, The Hidden World of Animal Consciousness. Um, It's a very interesting uh, title and cover, and it really caught my eye. And um, I, I really enjoyed reading the book. And the conversation was really, really, um, exciting for me because while there's a lot of um, behavioral ecology, a lot of evolutionary aspects of the conversation, you know, a lot of this is philosophy. A lot of this is just phenomenology, um, which, you know, is an interest of mine, obviously. And so David and I got along very well. um, And we talked about so many interesting things. We start the conversation by talking about the history of studying dreams, where this comes from, how people have been doing this. Um, We talk about how there was a big lapse in between where it wasn't really studied as much. We talk about how the sleep cycle works in animals. We talk about how animals dreaming could be uh, phenomenological as opposed to computational. We talk about animal dreams and consciousness. We talk about various models of consciousness, lucid dreaming. We mention Zahavi and Merleau Ponty's idea of presence and phenomenology. We talk about the role of imagination in dreams, uh, moral entitlements, and and many other topics. Um, Again, I had such a wonderful time uh, talking with David. He's uh, such a sharp thinker, um, original thinker, and really trying to understand, you know, animals in general and and their behavior, but just also you know, what are some of the implications for other animals, including humans? And, um, you know, it's, it's really, really interesting as we continue to study dreams and we study consciousness and, you know, what that looks like for humans, but you know what that could look like for, for other animals as well. And, um, it's a fantastic book that he has. Um, and I, I just had such a blast with this conversation. And so now I bring you David Benya Guzman. I'm here with David Peña Guzman. David, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm I'm really looking forward to talking to you about your work and uh, and your new book. So so thanks for for coming on. I appreciate you having me here. Thanks. Of course, of course. Um, Before we get into all the good stuff, uh, tell folks who you are, um, what you do, what you study, all those all the particulars. All the particulars. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, my name is David Peña Guzman. And I am an associate professor in the School of Humanities and Liberal Studies at San Francisco State University in San Francisco, California, where I have been for about five years. And I teach a variety of courses, primarily in the history of science, the philosophy of animals, as well as literary theory and the history of art. Wow, so this is a wide range of, of interest in things that you're teaching. Oh, that's fantastic. That's great. <laughs> yes, that's great. The value of the humanities, folks. <laughs> that's great. No, that's, that's good. I, I think more and more people are pushing for um, more interdisciplinary types of uh, approaches to things, which is really, really good. Um, you have written a very accessible and very fantastic book, um, which is called When Animals Dream, The Hidden World of Animal Consciousness. So obviously, well, I'll just say the cover is alone appealing because I love octopuses. It's a really cool octopus on the cover. And then you're talking about dreaming in animals and then consciousness. It just it, it just hit all the spots for me. It just is everything I wanted. It. <laughs> and then I read the book and I was super excited. It's always cool when um, either people I've talked to or other people I've read, you know, every chapter are getting kind of reference. It's like, oh, that's cool. I've read that book by that person or that's super cool that he, he mentioned that. So that was also really cool, too. So the book's fantastic. Um, I guess uh, where... 
where in your um, repertoire, I guess, is where you were like, hmm, let me write a book about animal consciousness and dreams in animals. What made you decide to kind of tackle that topic? Well, I do have an interest in animals, animal minds, animal cognition, and animal ethics that predates the writing of this book. And the origin story for this book is not particularly exciting. <laughs> I was doing research on something completely unrelated. I was working on the ethics of animal models in neuroscientific research. So whether it is ethically justified to use animals to study conditions and then try to make extrapolations based on that to human subjects. And a few years ago, I was reading an article about this and the authors in passing made a reference to the fact that the, that the research subjects in their study, which were rats in that particular case, would take naps in between doing experiments. So between running mazes and things like that, they would sleep to rest. And the authors made a passing comment. They didn't, on, they didn't make anything um, significant out of it, but they made a passing comment like, oh, we wonder what they were dreaming about in mm -hmm. those moments of rest. And at the time that I read that, I also didn't think anything of it. I didn't take it super seriously. And I kept going with my research. I then realized that for a few days and for a few weeks, I kept going back to that passing reference. Mm. And eventually I thought to myself, wait a minute, how come I've never thought about this question? Mm -hmm. Do other animals have dream experiences? Do, you, do they undergo dream sequences at some point mm -hmm. in their sleep cycle? And I decided to start looking into it. And I discovered to my surprise that there is a small body of research about animal dreaming. Mm -hmm. um, it's not huge, but it does date back all the way to the 1950s. And I initially decided to write an article about the subject until I realized that my own research had outgrown the boundaries of an mm. article and it needed to be a book. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I, I was thinking about animals in the laboratory and then this, this random remark really um, prompted me to then write what turned a couple of years later, two years later, mm. into this this larger project that is now coming out next month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's it's so interesting how sometimes it's, it can be just like that one small thing, and it just like stays stuck in your brain. And you're like, you can't get you can't get it out, and you're like, I have to like figure this out. What is this? What is this about? And it's crazy how uh, some things will happen like that. Um, uh, interestingly, um, I haven't talked about this too much actually in the podcast, but I also have an interest in dreams. That was part of my dissertation in the beginning. Um, and my chairwoman very wisely said, too much, too many things going on. We can't tackle it all. We just you know, <laughs> need you to finish and graduate. And I said, yes, I like that. That's a good idea. So, but I did do a, a decent lit review and there are all those articles are in a box in my garage somewhere, but um, on dreams and humans uh, mm -hmm. and somewhere in there. Uh, there was reference to other animals dreaming. So that, that's somewhere in the back of my mind, the book stuck out. I was like, oh, this is cool. I haven't thought about this in a while. And then, yeah, and then reading your book, it was it was great. So you, your book is, as I said in the beginning, pretty accessible because it's basically four chapters that are kind of tackling different uh, aspects of this. So um, it's, it's, it's very good. And so I guess we can kind of follow that sort of outline. And so I guess in terms of the first part, which is the science of, of animal dreaming, you know, obviously people know that humans dream, um, whether people remember them or not is another question, but, but all humans dream. Um, so are humans obviously the only animal to dream? And it seems like there isn't. Uh, it seems like other animals dream. But if, if that's the case, how do we know that empirically? How do we know that there's dreams going on? Is it just a basic uh, neurophysiology of things of like the same or analogous things happen in the brain uh, with, with other animals as it does in humans? Or how do we know very specifically that it is animals that are actually in fact dreaming? Yeah, so I, I think you're right to begin with this question because it is the first question that I get, right? How do we know this on empirical grounds? And the interesting thing about this question is that it is trickier than it seems because yeah. 
as humans, um, we face this question of difference when we talk about other species. Other species have different bodies, they have different perceptual systems, different sensory systems, different evolutionary histories. And so their experience of the world and ours are separated by, by this gap. Mm -hmm. And so there is no direct empirical evidence of dreaming in other animals. There is never going to be that silver bullet that mm -hmm. is going to convince all the skeptics, especially skeptics who believe that dreaming is an exclusively human function. And there are people who, who believe that. However, in the book, I make the case that by now, we do have sufficient scientific and philosophical evidence to believe that a human-centric or an anthropocentric theory of dreaming is probably insufficient. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do in order to sift through that evidence is really look at cases in which we have, as you point out, some analogous um, neural functions where we have analogous sleep behaviors. Mm -hmm. And from that evidence, try to create a larger picture about what the most likely and most parsimonious explanation for our observations are. And mm -hmm. so a lot of the book, especially that opening chapter, which is about the science, focuses on, on two kinds of evidence. It focuses on neuroscientific evidence, what happens in the brains of animals when they fall asleep. And it focuses on behavioral science, mm -hmm. what their bodies do mm -hmm. uh, during sleep and whether those neural and behavioral manifestations that we can observe and that we can describe, whether they are indicators of dream phenomenology, of, of subjective dreaming in the case of these other species. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important how you're delineating what is what we can know and what are some things that can be inferences, but good inferences. Um, and we do that when you're when we're making scientific structures or, or models of sorts that we, we make these types of inferences to make you know, certain uh, predictive models of things. And so I think it's a good distinction. Obviously, historically, um, you know, you know, the the history of dreams goes back a long ways right but i think probably the one of the most important texts of course 19 1900 or 1901 i can't recall is the interpretation of dreams by freud uh that's kind of the big big thing in the 20th century of course people have talked about dreams in other uh, uh literature uh far further back but that's kind of one of the big pieces of a kind of organized system of sorts of trying to organize it at least um what is it about this, this, the origins, I guess, of the interest uh, in dreams for humans and, and animals? And why do you call this thing the, the silent century, where people seem to show less interest? There was people were, you know, saying it was, you know, junk science or, or, or you know, they weren't just interested in doing studies on it. Um, yeah, it kind of seems that there's some interest, it goes away, and then now it comes back. So what can we make, I guess, of the arc of the history of studying dreams in humans and in animals? Yeah, the arc is quite long. I think you're right that a lot of uh, modern readers and writers um, might go immediately to Freud just because he had such a strong influence on so many discourses in the 20th century, not just neuroscience and psychology, but also philosophy, uh, the arts, uh, cinema, um, the humanities in general. But interest in dreams in general is extremely, extremely old. Mm -hmm. And so is interest in the dreams of animals. So we, we already find accounts of animal dreaming in the ancient Greeks um, during the classical age of, of, of Athens. So we're talking here about the fifth and the fourth century uh, BCE. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, Aristotle talks about the dreams of animals in his book, The History of Animals. And uh, so does the Roman philosopher Lucretius in the first centuries uh, CE in his book on the nature of things. And they have very different views about dreaming and how dreaming is generated by the, by the body, but they agree that it's not something that we find exclusively in human beings. So they, they look at the behavior of other animals and they say, you know, why are these dogs barking in the middle of their sleep cycle? Why are horses kicking 
or um, making nasolabial movements um, that suggest that they're having some kind of subjective experience. And if you follow that arc historically forward, you also find comments about the dreams of animals here and there throughout the medieval period, uh, the Renaissance, and even the early modern period. By the time we get to the 19th century, so pushing it uh, forward a couple of centuries, these discussions about the dreams of animals start getting filtered specifically through the latest theory uh, that defines the the 19th century, and that's Darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection. And Darwin himself talks about this. He doesn't talk about it in his most famous book on uh, the origin of species, but he does talk about it in a book that he wrote a few years later um, on the descent of man. Hmm. And there he talks about all sorts of mental processes in animals as existing on the same continuum as mental processes that we see in human beings, things like conceptualization, things like um, mathematical calculation, um, emotions like empathy, things like that. And the interesting thing is that even though Darwin was very open and friendly to the idea that other animals also experience dreaming, that openness starts to disappear at the turn of the century. And that's what triggers what, as you point out in the book, I call the silent century, which is a period roughly from, um, let's say, the 1880s, 1890s, all the way to the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. Um, so it's not a literal century, it's more of a right. symbolic century. <laughs> and the reason here has to do with a different arc, and that is the, the evolutionary arc of psychology as a science. Mm -hmm. At the start of the 20th century, psychology is, is trying really hard to prove its status as an empirical science. Mm -hmm. And a lot of psychologists believe that the best way to prove that they're doing real science was to follow the example of physics, to mm -hmm. model their activity and their methods after what the physicists were doing in studying physical nature. And so they start discarding anything that doesn't fit that physical or physicalist mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. And of course, the first thing to get discarded, and this is something that, that we've known for quite some time, is mental states, because by definition, mental states are not easily measurable. They're not mm -hmm. easily controllable, like physical objects. Mm -hmm. And so people in psychology really stop talking about mental states for a long time, and that includes dreaming. And they start focusing only on that, which is measurable and controllable, which is behavior. And so it's because of the rise of behaviorism that at least according to the story that I tell in the book, we have this long silent century where people suddenly stop talking about the dreams of animals, even though it had been a pretty lively subject of discussion throughout the second half of, of, the, 20, of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, this is definitely something that is discussed in uh, some intro to psych courses and definitely the history of psychology. Um, where, yeah, behaviorism was huge. It was huge for a lot of things within psychology and other fields. And so, you know, now psychology then tried to emulate, you know, just medicine. And how are we aligning ourselves with, you know, uh, medicine? And, um, you know, and so now uh, there are, there's a, there's another chapter with the history of psychology and and some of the other areas of how how it's doing science now or not with replication and things like that. So that's a, another conversation for another time for another time. But um, uh, yes, I think you're absolutely right. And so it's it's interesting though how I guess for for listeners these things have to be placed in context, right? Like it's very mm -hmm. reasonable to understand why would you want to when you're trying to um, formal for, make up make a formal system uh of a, of a discipline you want it to be pretty uh 
pretty solid. You don't want it to be too loose. You don't want it to be too woo woo. You don't want it to be too, you know, kind of the, the person selling you the, the snake oil. You want it to be very, very good. And so many times as these things go, it's a pendulum, right? They swing to one side and they swing to the other side and et cetera. So, and so, you know, as you're, as you say in the book is, yeah, one of the things to go was, you know, dreams. Like, oh, we're not going to study that. You know, we're going to just study behaviors and, you know, Skinner and Pavlov are doing some interesting things. Let's just focus on that. And those are great. I mean, they were, they were super important, but unfortunately we, we lost time, decades of research on dreams. And so, you know, now we have a, a slow uh, renaissance of people trying to, to examine that. You, you talk about in the first chapter, as you mentioned, some of the neuroscience as well. Um, you give the example of the zebra finches, right? And so, and look at the certain brain regions. So maybe just as an example, um, what does this tell us about dreaming and specifically how is this computational and not phenomenological? I thought that was a very interesting way of, of stating it. Um, so maybe just give us the example of the two sleep states of, uh, zebra finches. Yeah. So most animals, I, I think most animals by now we know have at least two cycles uh, or two phases of the sleep cycle. So when they go to sleep, it's not as if they're in the same physiological and arguably mental state the whole time. Um, the sleep cycle is bifas biphasic, uh, meaning that it, it does change somewhere in the middle at some point. And uh, there are a lot of terms that scientists use to describe those two, two phases. Um, sometimes it's, it's called a slow versus a fast phase. Sometimes it's called a non-REM versus REM, depending on whether or not we observe um, mm -hmm. REMs, rapid, rapid eye movements. And in the case of research on zebra finches, which I talk about in, in the book, we know that the same applies to birds, that they experience this division of the sleep cycle and that during the phase of the sleep cycle, which we let's just call it fast, where there's a lot of neural activity happening um, that is comparable to the kind of neural activation that we observe in the waking state, the zebra finches are experiencing something. They are undergoing some kind of experience. And so one of the debates that I point to in the book and on which I do take a stand um, is whether or not this neural activity is purely computational, whether it is just information processing that is happening um, in the brains of these animals without any conscious awareness, much like computer processing on a, on a computer, like the Mac Air through which I am speaking to you right now, <laughs> or whether all that neural activity that is happening is phenomenological, meaning that it indicates a subjective lived experience for these animals, i.e. a dream. And I make the argument that if we interpret all the evidence available to us of what is happening to these birds when they are entering this fast phase of sleep, the evidence points to a phenomenological interpretation rather than a computationalist one. Mm -hmm. And I think the debate between those two views really boils down to how we see animals on a very fundamental level. Mm -hmm. Do we think that animals are just machines that process information without feeling, without experience, without subjective awareness? Or do we think that they, they truly are phenomenological subjects that experience the world, even if in radically non-human ways. Mm -hmm. And and I definitely side with that second interpretation of animals. So to be clear, maybe maybe for listeners this might be helpful. So most of the time for at least in humans, I'm not sure how much it is in, in uh I guess non-human animals, but um sleep is usually part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So our bodies <clears throat> have this when we're awake, we're very active, right? And, and in various ways, our brain's active, um, very much so our bodies are active. We're trying to make sure we're not getting killed or, you know, <laughs> that we're, 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 we're able to defend ourselves, that we're surviving. But our bodies, like anything else, they need to, time to recover and relax and rest. And so our parasympathetic nervous system kicks in, uh, many other systems as well. But that's the one that's kind of, uh, um, 
on on gets the green light when we're sleeping and so we need this time to basically recharge essentially but our brains are still active hence dreaming right and of course you can dream in REM and non-REM sleep I mean it can happen both but it is many times seen in REM sleep so with, with, I would imagine that this is true for at least for vertebrates and maybe for for other animals at large that they also have some element of needing to have a space to rest um, or for their bodies to rest or their brains to rest as well. Um, how do how but, but the, the one thing that you're saying here is that if you're talking about the phenomenological component of this, I think it's important to note that as it is with humans, um, it would have to, this is an inference, but you tell me if I'm wrong on this, that this isn't a volitional thing. Like no one chooses to dream, right? You know, I don't choose to dream. Uh, of course, there's lucid dreaming, but that's still not a volitional choice. Um, there's just an awareness. But with animals, they're not choosing, right? So it, it, these things are happening, right? This is happening in the brain. Why? You know, that's still the $64,000 question. But <laughs> I guess the for anyone, for humans as well, people still don't know why we really, really, why we dream, the utility of it. But I guess the question I have then is, what can we say about this phenomenological content? You know, are, 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 are birds talking or, you know, or dreaming about, you know, uh, how they can fly, you know, places they normally can't get to? Or are they having, you know, some weird surreal dreams like humans do? Obviously, we don't know, <laughs> right? But it may, maybe, right? Have you ever had a dream where you, you, you're in a dream and you, you uh, in the dream you can fly? Maybe maybe <laughs> birds have this, uh, this, this dream where they can walk like humans or something. I don't know, right? Maybe, or they can do what what the cheetah can do or something um but what makes you um kind of take this stand i guess on, on on this piece yeah so there are a few points here that i'll want to differentiate and um to to clarify so you are absolutely correct that dreaming is not volitional in the sense that it's not as if we fall asleep and then we make a rational decision you know i'm gonna sleep right now the one counter example to that uh as you note is cases of lucid dreaming, where we do exercise some top-down executive control over, mm. over our dream experiences, but that's, that's not the most common dream mm. experience for the majority of us. Mm -hmm. um, I myself was quite a lucid dreamer when I was a kid, and I thought it was special because I could control my own <laughs> dreams. Writing this book uh, disabused me of that notion <laughs> since it's, it's more common than I realized. Um, and so, it is not volitional. And so when I talk about defending a phenomenological interpretation of what happens to animals during sleep, I don't mean that it is intentional or volitional. I mean that it is experiential. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean that it feels like something for these animals to undergo these states. And that is what is at stake in the debate between computational and phenomenological interpretations of animal sleep. I want to argue that in fact, the animals are, are facing something akin to a phenomenal or phenomenological field, a field of experience in which they act, um, even if it happens exclusively in their dreams, of course. Now, you are correct to, to also note that a lot of what happens um, during sleep has to do with um, rest, uh, resetting the body. Uh, this is where the activation of the um, uh, parasympathetic system comes in. The things that point me in the direction of phenomenology here are two. One, as I noted, is all the indicators that the brains of these animals are replaying what appear to be wake-like episodes. So they, they really are doing the same thing during a specific mm. phase of the sleep cycle as mm. they are when they are awake. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that it's not just the brain, it's also the body. So mm -hmm. even though normally we are resetting and calm, calming down and, um, and, and the body is resting during sleep, the exception to this is when there is a redirection of the arousal profile of the body, especially during that fast phase of sleep. So one of the things that we know in the case, for example, of, of many mammals is that when they enter into that fast uh, phase of sleep, it's not just that their brains are lighting up like a Christmas tree, it's that their bodies suddenly mm -hmm. start changing their physiological state. Mm -hmm. Instead of resting, they start 
getting worked up. Mm-hmm. Respiration rate increases. Um, the uh, heart rate increases. Um, and, and so all these are signs of, of arousal, which again, points to a kind of emotional state mm-hmm. um, that the animal is in. And so I do not want to deny that a lot of what happens during sleep is unconscious. It happens behind the veil of consciousness. There's a lot of memory processing, a lot of memory consolidation that happens that, that we're not even aware of, that we don't feel. Mm-hmm. The question is whether all sleep is unconscious. Mm-hmm. And, and my answer to that is no, because I think dreams are conscious experiences that happen during sleep, mm-hmm. but they are not volitional. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I follow with you. I, I think I mostly agree, mostly because it sounds like you're making and on the phenomenological piece of that it's an experience. And we know that much as if we, we know that with humans, you know, people will yell in their sleep, they'll move their legs, you know, they'll, you know, twitch, they'll, you know, et cetera. And then there's the way we can map this physiologically, right? Like if, you know, if anyone's ever had a dream where they're falling out of a building or they're falling out of an airplane um, or they're sinking to the bottom of the ocean, like you're going to physical, your body is physically going to have those sensations, even though it's not really happening. Um, Of course, when you're unconscious and you're dreaming, you feel like it's really happening and then you wake (laughs) up and you're terrified. Um, But I I would imagine I'm thinking of dogs, right? So dogs, like I think many people or most people, if they've had a dog or been around dogs long enough, they'll see that dogs dream and they'll see dogs will bark in their sleep. They'll twitch their legs as if they're running or, you know, things like that. Is is that what you're kind of saying that we we, we can make an, an, an inference of based on the behaviors during sleep? that these animals are having an, an experience of whatever is going on based on the observed behaviors that we can see while they're sleeping. That's how you're, 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 you're making the stand here on the phenomenological basis of this? Yes, and what's been really fascinating for me in trying to make this argument is coming to the realization of just how polarizing that view is. <laughs> As you're right in that if I tell somebody who has lived with a dog um, as their domestic companion for a long time, their answer tends to be, well, obviously, who would disagree with that? <laughs> and yet people disagree. There is, and yet a lot of scientists warn against drawing that conclusion precisely because they they are looking for that silver bullet right Uh that that piece of evidence that will prove without any doubt without leaving any room um for doubt that in fact there is an experience happening there and uh, and it's very difficult to provide that so one of the things that i noticed this was a pattern that's that that stood out to me very very early on in the research process a lot of the scientists whose research I cite in the book refuse to say that animals dream. Mm. And you will always find either a reference in their publication, sometimes in a footnote, mm-hmm. making that disclaimer. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, we're noticing all these parallels mm-hmm. at the neurological or at the physiological or at the behavioral level, but we cannot say that the animals are actually having a dream experience. Mm-hmm. And, and that's where um, I step in and I, I want to argue that that, that, that refusal to take that step um, is not as reasonable as it seems. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, it, it, it raises a question of what sort of evidence they might be waiting for. Mm-hmm. Well, I, so I think in the book you, you mentioned um, that you have disagreements with, with Clayton and, Sh- and Schnell. Uh, about interpreting behaviors of, of animals. Is this, this is correct, right? I'm getting the names right, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's Alex uh, Schnell, right? She's the mm-hmm. Australian uh, researcher. Yeah, she was on my podcast uh, last year. Um, and she's great. She's, she's, uh, she's quite oh, yes. lovely. She's brilliant. Um, really, really awesome to talk to. Him. And um, I think we we had a conversation about we were obviously talking about cuttlefish. That's what she studied. We were talking about octopus. We were talking about uh, uh, the cephalopods. And I, I we, there was, I remember one point in a conversation where she was very she was hesitant. I think she was trying to be judicious in how her her claims, but about ascribing 
intelligence and or consciousness to uh, various cephalopods, right? Because they can twist with their you know arms or whatever their tentacles, uh, you know, uh, jars, and because they can put things in one way. There's there's a certain element of learning, but that doesn't. And of course, learning is a part of intelligence, but it's not only that. Um, and then there's a big leap between saying that they're conscious, um, and I think. Godfrey Smith also uh, has certain ideas about this as well. So I guess uh, what is where where we don't have to spend too much time on this, but I guess where what's the fundamental disagreement here with some of these folks, and, and where are the areas where you do agree? I guess on, on approach or positions or things like that in terms of how we're uh, making sense of these animal behaviors. Yeah. So. You're, you're right that Clayton and Schnell are um, brilliant animal researchers. Mm -hmm. um, and my disagreement with them has to do precisely with the question of when it is okay to take that additional step of attributing to an animal an emotional or a cognitive capacity that technically goes a little bit beyond what we see. Um, but that nonetheless illuminates what we see in a way that otherwise we wouldn't be able to illuminate. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a, a, the concrete example. Mm -hmm. um, our disagreement is about octopuses. Mm -hmm. uh, as you point out, the, the cover of the book is somewhat mm -hmm. psychedelic. It's a really beautiful cover. Um, I'm, I'm very thankful to the team uh, mm -hmm. with Princeton University Press mm -hmm. for it. And it is an octopus that is meant to represent um, uh, Heidi, an, an octopus that became famous a few years ago uh, when she was recorded having a dream. Mm -hmm. um, her, her mantle started changing colors while she was asleep. And there was this debate in, in the media about, is that really a dream or not? Mm -hmm. um, and Clayton and Schnell as you point out, are, are extremely judicious in their approach to the description of animal behavior. And so their position is, you cannot say that the octopus is dreaming because we don't see a dream, we just see the behavior. And so you should limit yourself to describing the behavior in, in great detail. Now, the question is, how do you describe that behavior? They say, just say that the the muscles of the animals are twitching. You know, it's the most sort of reductive um, behaviorist approach to thinking about animals. So you can't say anything beyond literally what you see. My concern about this conservative or judicious approach to describing animal behavior is that it really robs us of the possibility of thinking about what these behaviors mean. So there is a difference between the facts that we observe and then the meaning of, of the observed behaviors. And so if, if we raise a question of why are the muscles of the octopus twitching in the way that they are, following the pattern that they do, what answer do we get? Um, and I want to say that the, best inf that the inference to the best explanation is that the octopus is having a dream experience. Um, Clayton and Schnell, I believe, want to stay away from that additional step. So that's what it boils down to. And my concern is that the judiciousness that they, that they embody here actually does a great disservice, not just to animals, but also to us, because it keeps us in this relationship to animals where we're always suspicious about their capacities. And the problem is that in theory, you can always just describe the behavior literally without attributing any capacities to animals, right? Why is the, the dog uh, moving its, its tail? It doesn't matter, you just describe the movement of the tail and you never get to the emotion behind it. You never get to the feeling or to the cognition or the thinking. Um, and that's where I wanna go. But I have to recognize that this might be a difference in, in our disciplinary orientations. They are scientists who are interested in describing behavior. I'm a philosopher 
who is interested in animal experience and animal subjectivity. So it might be that we just have different interests in mind. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said that because I, as I'm listening to this, I can definitely hear both sides of this. And I and and this is where it's like, well, it just seems like there's a, a different emphasis point. I guess I'll, I'll just it's a it's an interesting debate. Um, and I guess my thing here is if we're using their argument, well, you could make the same case for humans. I've never seen a human's dream. It's based on report. It's based on the, the, the reliability of memory. But we know things are happening in the brain. Sure, we can see that. We can put some electrodes in our brain. We do a sleep study, et cetera. We know that things are going on. We can look at the observable behaviors of people when they're sleeping. Yep, their leg twitches. They're tossing and turning. They're making weird sounds, <laughs> whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's what in the book I call our problematic historical double standard about mm -hmm. the problem of other minds. Mm -hmm. We are extremely liberal when it comes to other humans, even in the absence of verbal reports. You know, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. talk mm -hmm. to people about whether young children uh, dream, they'll say, oh yeah, I've, I've seen it. I have no reason to doubt it. So there we begin from a presumption of belief and then change it if there is reason to doubt. Mm -hmm. With animals, we begin from a presumption of doubt mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. look for very, very high quality evidence in order to justify belief. So we get things backward. And because I, I come at it from this philosophical and ethical perspective, I think that that double standard has, has done tremendous harm um, to animals so, so, generally. So Yes, yes, yes. I, I would agree with you on that point. And here's the thing. So, I mean, only because I've, I've talked to Alex, and and I, I know she's 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 very good at what she does, and she's she tries her very hardest. I, I would never say that this is what she's. I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but I, I think that there's the, the the conservative or judicious view is to try and say we want to make scientifically sure that the claim we're making we can support, and I 120 percent respect that. We need more people like that. However. Um, it does have this piece of maybe just as a, as an indirect result of, of, a uh, for so long, as you're, as you're mentioning this, humans are always the special animal. We're the special ape. We're always different from other animals on the planet. And I think maybe in some ways there's things that make us different or set us apart. Sure, we we have language and our brains are you know probably the most dense neuronally, et cetera. Fine, we have crazy abstraction. Fine, but there's many things that don't make us any different from other animals. And so I guess the the worry here is though, do you <laughs> you don't want to because it happens for humans, infer that it must happen for other animals too, because that's a slight anthropomorphizing. However, um, there is a, there's a, almost like a, like a rubric of sorts of, okay, we, we can see that there are things that are happening when one is dreaming, we can see the behaviors, we can maybe have some neuro uh, uh, data, we see this analogous, uh, or, or we, if we juxtapose this with how humans do it, not to compare it to humans, but you could compare different types of animals that have dream sites and say, okay, there's something happening here that maybe we could say that there's a phenomenological uh, uh, um, aspect for, for animals. And so, of course, right, you're never going to know 110% sure, but maybe we could say that. Um, so I, I really can... I'm 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 uh, I'm riding the fence here on this one, right? I'm not trying to not take a stand. I, I can really <laughs> see I can really see both approaches. Um and I really I think the last point that you had said was right is you know, if someone's coming at it from a philosophical uh, uh angle, yes, the phenomenology is very interesting. Um and that would make sense. If you're coming at it from a pure uh, scientific uh uh angle, um you know, I could see that pos position as well, though I will say with science, there's always philosophy in science, right? You, if you've got to develop hypotheses, that comes from somewhere, right? So, um, but anyways, but um, yeah. that's, that's how I kind of see it. I, I don't know if I'm getting it right, but uh, yeah. 
Well, I like the way you put it, that there is always philosophy and science. Um, as a philosopher of science, <laughs> I spend a lot of my time uh, teaching my students precisely that. And one of the things that I would want to bring in to this discussion is that this image of judiciousness in the explanations that we give for observed behaviors already has a lot of philosophy in it. And it is the philosophy of the 17th century. It's the, the view of the animal as a machine, whether it is consciously embraced or not, whether it is in modified form or not. The notion that it is appropriate to interpret living life, living beings, non-human life forms, without any appeal to subjective phenomenological categories is already to take a certain kind of philosophical stance about who animals are. And a lot depends on how strict one wants to be also about that judiciousness. Because here we find scientists that fall on, on all kinds of the spectrum. If you want to be really, really technical about only describing what is observed um, to, to the scientific eye, then you never will get to emotion. Emotion is a subjective state. So you are not allowed to talk about animals having emotions. You will never get to um, cognitive states or, or mental states. Because again, those are not observable. It doesn't matter how many brain imaging studies and how many psychological experiments you conduct. You will never get um, to social intersubjective dynamics with animals. And so the interesting thing is that a lot of scientists will say, I want to be judicious, but they will make some concessions. But I do think animals have emotions. Um, and, and it's the nature of that concession that often, I think, gives the lie to the value of that strict judiciousness. That if you are very strict about truly being committed only to the study of observable behavior, I believe you'd really end up with, a, with an impoverished view of animals that runs against the grain of even our most basic intuitions about what an animal is, right? An animal is not a rock. An animal is a living being with, with a perspective on the world. And you will never get to that perspective if you never make that kind of leap, um, the question is, again, what do we need in order to justify that leap? Yeah, I, 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 agree, with, I agree with much of what you said. And, and just to be clear, I don't think Clayton or Schnell are saying that they're trying to other animals. I don't think they're trying to oh, do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they're just being, you know, they just want to be as, as precise as possible, which I can respect. But I, I, I firmly take your, your point, though, of... Um, we don't want to be too, uh, just in general, I'm just saying this as a general statement, we don't want to be too um, parochial in how we're looking at some of these things where it's just, just only this way and that's it because um, we don't want to be too, too cavalier or lazy either and just, you know, start not even anthropomorphizing, but just making these you know, spurious claims about animals that maybe aren't true either. So, I, and I don't think you're saying that either, but I, I, I do think it is a, a, a tightrope to walk. And it is, it is very interesting because maybe now listeners will, you know, as they've heard us kind of, you know, kind of talk about this for, for past couple of minutes, we'll kind of see where, you know, this is what scientists and philosophers, you know, that's, this is what they fight about at conferences, right? Is, you know, <laughs> how can we know this, right? You know, and that's, and, but, but I, I do, I do think it's important because for so long, for a variety of reasons, you know, humans are special. And I, and I, that, that's the, that's the party line. And, and I think that that's, true and not true and 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 we're part of the the animal kingdom uh, just like every other multicellular organism on the planet and unicellular organism and so we have a, the same parts and the same stuff that other organisms do right mm -hmm. and so you know if there's potential for us it doesn't mean it will be for other animals but it doesn't mean that it couldn't either and so i i, I hear you which which leads me to my my next point which moves, moves a little further in the book is you make this pretty pretty interesting claim you say it's impossible for an organism to dream and lack consciousness 
So that's a whole other animal, right? Uh, people <laughs> don't understand consciousness in humans. We're still, we're still talking about that, right? Uh, uh, you know, David Chalmers just put a book out on consciousness again. I mean, the people are, you know, Damasio just put a book out on consciousness. People are still trying to figure this out for humans. We don't have the, the, the silver bullet. We don't know where it is in the brain. We don't know what it looks like. We don't. We have like a lot of models, a lot of ideas, some really cool stuff. But what makes you make this this statement that it's impossible for an organism to dream and lack consciousness? Yeah, so that for me is a purely logical point, um, okay. but it, it does require some clarification um, of what we mean, or at least what I mean in that context by consciousness. Um, and, and I simply mean being aware of a world, having a world manifest itself to you as the subject, that lies at the epicenter of that world. So it's a phenomenal logical, again, conception of, of consciousness, where it means I am here and have a world that appears to me. Now, the reason that it is impossible, and sorry, I- Sorry, yes. can I, let me interject here. So to, to be clear on some of the terms here, <clears throat> this is transcending subject object, right? When we're talking about the phenomenology, we're talking about what is the experience of one's worldhood, right? So we're understanding that we're in a context, right? So it's, it's, it's what is that entire, the, the totality of that experience, not the simple duality of subject object, that I'm a subject in an objective world, et cetera. That is true as well. I'm not saying that that's not true, but that you're looking even further of the phenomenological piece is when we're looking at the things themselves, what is that experience like? But what does that have to have that experience? Is, is, that, is that what you mean? Well, it's not necessarily even what is that experience like, but the having of that yes, experience. Yes. Having the experience, yes. Yes, 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 yes. having okay. a world <clears throat> that, that is mine. Um, <clears throat> and of course, that world will look very different for <clears throat> different animals based on their cognitive, sensory, <clears throat> perceptual categories, et cetera. Yes, uh, yes. So we know that a bee will leave, uh, a, a bee will live in a bee world, but a dog will live in, in its own dog like mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by consciousness in this, in this particular case. And the reason that it is impossible, and that's a very strong claim philosophically, it's a modal claim about, about it not, it, it being out of the realm of possibility, um, is because by definition, to dream is to find oneself in a dream world. So when I, um, when I have any kind of dream, even the most bizarre, the most illogical, the most upsetting dream, there is always a dream ego. There is an I in the dream mm -hmm. um, that experiences the world as its world. And so it is inconceivable and in fact impossible, I argue, to dream and have that ego in a world and not be the kind of animal that has that ego world relationship because mm -hmm. it simply reproduces it at the level of imagination in the dream state. Hmm. And so uh, that, makes, that makes sense. I, I, see, I see your logic here. In, in this second chapter in the book, you, you give a lot of theories. So we won't go over all of them, but maybe some of the important ones. Um, maybe the, the SAM model is a, is a good one to, to start with. So subjective, affective, metacognitive, maybe just give us the, the overview of, of, uh, of, of that model and why it's important here. Yeah, so the SAM model of consciousness is a, is a model that I introduce in chapter two of, of my book. And it's just an easy way for me to talk about three philosophical dimensions of dreams that I want to explore in connection to other animals. Um, and so S-A-M, SAM, um, each of them start, stands for each of those dimensions. There is the subjective dimension, again, that, that egological rooting of the self in a phenomenal field, just like I am here now, that sense of presence. Um, that I think is constitutive of all dreams. You cannot have a dream without a dream ego that experiences that dream. Again, that's just a purely logical point. And so in connection to that first dimension of the SAM model, the subjective, I, I make the argument that 
as soon as you accept that an animal is a dreamer, you must recognize that that animal has what I call subjective consciousness. And you're right, there's a lot of terminology. Some of it is philosophically heavy. In many ways, chapter two, where I lay out this model, is the most demanding chapter in the book, um, on my view, at least. That's where the the heavy lifting philosophically takes it, place. It was a great chapter to me. I loved it. I thought it was great. It was, it was fantastic. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love it too. I'll I'll stand by it. Um, <laughs> but I I think um, it, it is where I turn up the heat philosophically mm -hmm. um, in in comparison to the other ones. Now the second term, the the affective, refers to the fact that. You cannot have a dream that doesn't have some kind of affective profile. Every dream feels like something to the dreamer. Um, even the most um, simple dream where I dream I am just walking in an empty field um, has maybe a, an affective profile of rest, of relaxation. Um, it it affects me as a subject and triggers a kind of emotion. Even if it's not a strong emotion, um, it, it activates certain kinds of affects in me. And so I talk about dreams as fundamentally affective. And I think that this is backed by um, scientific research on dreams in humans. Um, although it does depend on our philosophical views about dreams in general. Going back to the comment you made about Freud, this is something that we learned from Freud also, that, that dreams have emotional content um, and, and they might be a gateway in, into our emotions, including emotions that we're not conscious of. They just pop out in our dreams. There's and a lot so, of uh, latent material in the unconscious that comes out in dreams. And then when we try to uh, find it in wake states, it's sometimes really strange. I, I guess I was just about the affective thing. I think you're right. I'm just playing with the idea of could it be sensations? Because affect is, is, I think, characteristically different. But I, 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 think, I think you're right, though. I think it is more affective. Um, most... Anytime you do any kind of question or anything about dreams or things like that, or even if you if you if you work with an analyst that does dream work, there's always the question of well, what did you feel in the dream, right? That's usually the question that's asked. What was the affective experience? So, like, so I I think you're right there. I think I think some people might be like, well, it's just sensations, but I I do think there's an affective component there. I I think I, I think that's probably most accurate. I agree with that. This is well, sorry, and sorry. no, I, I, I like this um, comment because it allows me to clarify that on my view, and this is something about which I hope to write more in the future, all sensation already has an affective component. So there is no affectless sensation because even the most basic uh, primal sensation will already have an evaluation of it being either positive or negative. Does it harm me? Does it feel okay? Um, and so, you know, when I sense the surface of the table, um, if it doesn't burn me, then it, it feels minimally pleasurable if we interpret uh, pleasure as the absence of pain or vice versa. And so there's no sensation without that very basic hedonic um, uh, polarity or of good versus bad, yay versus nay for the subject. So... The, uh, I, this is such an appealing conversation I want to have, uh, but it will lead us down a rabbit trail. <laughs> um, I, because I, I really want to like flush that out a lot. I've thought a lot about this as well. I've talked to people about this. Um, I would say I'm. I don't know about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I hear. I hear your argument. It, but it really just gets, gets down to emotional theory and things like that, which is which is super super important that people are talking about. Um, but I will promise you that we will have that yes. conversation at some point. I'll put, I'll put it that way. Okay. Like, okay. So. We'll, like I said, we can have it when I write more about <laughs> this in the future. Um, I can come back for, for a redo. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, for me, affect is, is it doesn't quite rise to the level of emotion. I do differentiate between affect and emotion and I play sensation in close dialogue with affect. Be that as it may. It captures the second dimension of the SAM model of consciousness, which is that, that there is this affective 
let's say, emotional mm-hmm. dimension to mm-hmm. dreams. Mm-hmm. The final one is the metacognitive. Now, this is probably the trickiest part of the book. Uh, and it is the part of the book where I'm very clear about the fact that I am stepping into speculative territory. Mm-hmm. Now, in the case of human beings, we know that we have what is called metacognition. We can think about the fact that we think. We can turn the mind upon itself and reflect on our own capacities for reflection. That's an important dimension of of our conscious experience. Now, the question is whether other animals have that. A lot of um, heated debates have taken place in the animal sciences um, about this issue. There is new research coming out um, from science and from philosophy about the possibility of animal metacognition, about Mm -hmm. the fact that maybe some animals, not all, Mm -hmm. some animals, especially the more cerebralized ones, um, have the capacity to sort of step back from their own mental states and reflect upon their own mental states. Mm -hmm. Um, How they do that is debated. Um, the extent to which they do that is debated, but I think by now animal metacognition is slowly creeping into the mainstream of the animal cognitive and behavioral sciences. Mm -hmm. Now, in the book, I point out that there is a close connection between dreaming and metacognition because there are some dreams, we already talked about them, lucid Mm -hmm. dreams, Mm -hmm. that are examples of metacognition. And so if we're talking about animals having dreams, I raise the question, could it be that some animals have lucid dreams? And if so, that would be yet further evidence for animal metacognition. Now, the evidence here is very, very, um, um, I don't want to say weak. I'll say it's not super strong uh, just because there is not a lot of research available uh, to try to develop this argument. But I I make the argument that it it might be possible for some animals, um, for a handful of animals, especially those that um, typically get brought into into discussions about metacognition. We're talking about elephants. We're talking about um, whales and dolphins. We're talking about um, non-human primates, like especially chimpanzees, um, um, sometimes bonobos as well. I argue that it may be possible for some of these animals um, to experience what we call lucid dreaming, to fall asleep, have a dream, and then in the middle of that dream, have something like an eureka moment of, huh, this is different than my normal waking experience. And if that's possible, then it it gives us this new avenue for thinking about animal cognition and animal metacognition without having to go to waking behavior. But again, I want to really emphasize that um, this is a a speculative claim, um, but it is a really fascinating claim. And I found a couple of theorists, well-known researchers uh, of dreaming, who are open to this possibility, who develop models of lucid dreaming understood as a kind of metacognition and who in their scientific publications sometimes have a a small line somewhere saying, based on what we know about the cognitive capacities of, of certain other species, it might be possible for them to have this as well. The animals that are often cited um, in connection to this are um, chimpanzees um, and in some cases, some, some kinds of birds mm-hmm. um, that, that have now crossed that metacognitive uh, threshold. Well, I can certainly see why lucid dreaming and metacognition are linked because you need, I don't, I don't want to say need, but I, I, I can't see um, lucid dreaming because of the awareness piece happening unless the animal has some capacity for abstraction 
I, as far as we know, um, you know, humans have the highest form of abstraction in the animal kingdom. Um, but there are certainly, I mean, you talk about chimps, you can talk about bonobos, maybe. Um, there are other, and, and some birds, uh, thinking of parrots, uh, um, that have this ability that can do a, a, a few layers of abstraction. So it wouldn't be surprising that these particular animals would potentially cross that Rubicon and say, oh, you know, maybe they're, they're aware of it. They, they may not know what the hell's going on, but they're aware that something's going on, right? Who, who knows? Um, and some of this is <clears throat> difficult because um, I, I've talked to a few people uh, about this, uh, and particularly with whales. Um, this stuff always is really hard to know and to measure because of the instruments we use. We have human instruments trying to measure things in non-human animals, right? So that's really tough, right? Because how do you develop an instrument for the animal that's specific? Now you can, again, it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, <laughs> there, there are uh, 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 instruments designed by humans for humans that also are terrible, right? So <laughs> that that definitely exists. So, but but it is hard to sometimes. You need a really good instrument. I think this is why a lot of people really like, you know, um, uh, kind of the mirror test, some variant of the marshmallow test, because they're kind of not loaded specifically on humans you could have some kind of cross uh, uh some crossing of sorts between different animal subjects so i think that there's some piece there so i think this sometimes will come down to instrumentality as well um I, I just while we're on the lucidity part of it you talk about a lucidity and c lucidity for a for attention c for cognition maybe just chat about that a little bit of that distinction yes so some dream experts before me have noted that not all lucid dreams are the same, or that at least we can differentiate between two different kinds of lucid dreams. And the distinction that they make um, has turned out to be very useful for me because it allows me to solve that problem of what you call abstraction and conceptuality. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of lucid dreaming as necessarily entailing some pretty high level of abstraction, the use of concepts, mm -hmm. um, especially the concept of dreaming itself, right? In a lucid dream, you say to yourself, this is a dream. So you're applying the concept dream to your present phenomenological mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. But that presupposes that you understand that you possess the concept dream. Mm -hmm. Talking about lucid dreaming in animals raises that question first and foremost. Do animals even have a concept of dreaming? Mm -hmm. Now, I actually don't think they do, or at least I don't think that's the best way of thinking about lucid dreaming in other species. But that's precisely why this difference between a lucidity and C lucidity has been very helpful for me to try to work through this really, really difficult terrain mm -hmm. of dreaming, consciousness, and metacognition. And the distinction goes like this. There are two kinds of lucid dreams. There are a lucid dreams where the dreamer simply recognizes that something is off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, this is not reality. Mm -hmm. um, but that's it. It's just the recognition that their current phenomenal field, there's something off about it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. That's how we can think about it. You attend to the field and you, re you realize that something is off. And so that's a kind of lucidity that doesn't require the highest level of abstraction, the highest level of judgment, the use of concepts like dream. On the other hand, you have C lucidity, where C stands for cognition. C lucidity is when you have that experience of incongruity, like, oh, something is off. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you start making inferences about what is going on. Oh, this must be a dream. Mm -hmm. I must have some executive control over what happens next. I decide to wake up. I decide to follow the dream through. 
um, which is what I used to do when I was 12, thinking I was super special with my lucid dreaming capacities. Um, <laughs> biggest blow to my ego um, in, in quite a while. And the importance of this distinction is that the dream researchers that I cite in, in the section on lucid dreaming, they clarify that lucid dreaming of the first kind, a lucidity, where it's just that, that, that gut feeling that something is off, doesn't need very sophisticated um, conceptual or abstracting capacities. And so I argue that if animals experience lucid dreaming, it would be something like a lucidity. Because I do not want to make the argument that that a dog is dreaming and suddenly the dog in its mind thinks, oh my gosh, this is, this is my dream. Um, because that does raise some, some technical questions about concept possession mm -hmm. and whether the concept of, dream is, of dreaming itself is available to other animals. But the raw experience of feeling that this bizarre world that doesn't follow the same laws as waking experience as the real world that experience of this is not reality, I think that is within, um, it is within the reach of some other animals. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I cannot give a very good answer as to which those animals are, um, and neither do the researchers that, that are also open to that possibility. Mm -hmm. um, but just the fact that that possibility is there for me is is mind bending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean absolutely because for any for for you know just for you know I guess the sake of argument I mean it's the fact of do other animals possess an idea of themselves a theory of mind other aspects of abstraction uh we know that they have executive functioning um some animals you know the sequencing planning organizing so you know now you throw into the mix <clears throat> abstraction um and what further levels that could be yeah i mean it it does change how you view other animals right these these aren't just yeah and i think that's um there's something to that with maybe certain people where it's like you know they will be very dismissive of animals like oh there's just kind of they're under us, right? You know, whatever. But no, it says like, hey, you know, there's there's elements where they're more and more like us than we really understand, which would would say you know, this is a different conversation, of course. But you know, what's the morals and ethics we have, right? Um, and, and more so than that, what's the kind of respect you have for another multicellular organism? And so it kind of uh, it can it can kind of shape and evolve you know, how maybe humans uh, approach uh, animals. I guess uh, two, two things here on, on this section, uh, again, still, still have you kind of on the theory, but I think it's important. You talk, talk about uh, Zahabi's subjective consciousness, right? It's a, it's a feeling of subjective presence and sense of bodily self-awareness. So maybe talk, talk to us about that, and then we can talk about this idea of um, the dream ego possessing a body image. Uh, that's a very interesting mm -hmm. kind of uh, play there. So maybe just talk about the, those two. Yeah, so Dan Sahavi is a phenomenologist and, um, well, neurophenomenologist who works at the intersection of these fields, phenomenology, uh, cognitive science, neuroscience. And he wrote a book in which he develops a, a theory of subjective consciousness. Um, that's his term. Um, unfortunately, when you enter into this, this field of consciousness studies, People use all kinds of variations upon the same terms, and it can mm -hmm. be a little bit confusing to keep track of, of all the different preferences, um, terminological preferences. But Sahavi introduces this term subjective consciousness, and he makes the argument in um, he makes this argument that when we think about subjective consciousness, we often think of of thinking, we think of cognition, of somebody sitting there and pondering, who am I, where am I, where am I going, and, you know, deep existential, almost rationalistic questions. And he says, no, there is a different kind of subjective awareness that we have, and that is not that complicated, that is actually quite simple. And it is 
the basic feeling of being present mm -hmm. in, again, a phenomenological field. Um, this is where you really see to what extent the discipline of phenomenology influences my thinking. Mm -hmm. And for this very basic sense of subjective consciousness, you don't need language, you don't need concepts, you don't need reason. So even infants, newly born, um, have it. They have mm. this feeling of being there. Can, we, can I make a footnote here? So sure. th this reminds me of um, Merleau Ponty, said, you know, the famous French phenomenologist, made this very same point when he taught um, in, in France for the psychology department. He said, children pre-language know things phenomenologically. They don't need language to understand their experience of the world. And in fact, you, we, we have a better understanding of children when we understand their phenomenology, divorced of waiting until they get to five or six when they're in grade school, or even when they start to become verbal, you know, 18 months, two years old or whatever. So it's, it's interesting mm -hmm. how these ideas, you know, Merleau Ponty was in the 40s and 50s, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how people continue the, this, these, uh, these ideas as well. Many of what you're saying is, it reminds me of some of the work by Husserl, um, who also was kind of the godfather of phenomenology. So it's interesting interesting how these things mm -hmm. still live on, which is, which is really powerful. Anyway, it's just a small thing. Yeah. yeah, no, and I, I, and Sahavi leans on Merleau Ponty to develop this embodied feeling yeah. of, of presence, um, which again, it's just this being there. I am here, I am now. And because even infants have it, we can say that it, it happens below the threshold of those higher cognitive capacities that most humans, most neurotypical humans develop later in life. And for me, this is very helpful and very exciting um, because it also allows us to think about animal experience and subjectivity in this way. And Merleau-Ponty himself wrote extensively about animals early in his life. Um, he wrote a book called The Structure of Behavior, which is, mm -hmm. I think, one of the best early critiques of behaviorism, uh, a critique of, of the notion that, again, animals can be understood just by describing their behavior and interpreting all their actions as if they were mechanical reflexes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, once you get to this notion of subjective consciousness that Sahavi talks about, I think we need to add what I call bodily self-awareness, a, a basic mastery of the boundaries of my body, a, an implicit tacit or as phenomenologists often say, prethetic, mm -hmm. uh, before the more theoretical aspects mm -hmm. of the mind get going, mm -hmm. prethetic mastery of my body, where I am implicitly aware of its possibilities, of its limits, of what I can and cannot do with it. Mm -hmm. And so if you take those two things, Sahavi's notion of subjective presence, then what I call bodily awareness, those two things give you the kind of subjectivity that interests me in thinking about dreams. So I think in a dream, you always have those two things. You have that feeling of subjective presence and you have a sense of bodily awareness. Even if your body schema in a dream is extremely unstable, right? One moment you have two legs, the next moment you have 20 limbs, mm -hmm. but you always have a body with a certain structure. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, that dreams necessarily have that subjective presence and that bodily self-awareness, even if it's very basic and very um, uh, pre-rational, mm -hmm. it would mean that animals who dream also have the kind of subjectivity that is defined by that feeling of presence and by that sense of bodily mastery. And so that's where I, I want to use dreams, not just for the sake of proving that animals dream, but as a portal for much more, let's just say, heady philosophical mm -hmm. questions about who animals are, what kind of subjects are they, how do their minds and bodies interact with one another to generate experience. Mm -hmm. So that's where this Ahavi piece comes mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. uh, you explain it very well, and I, I'm 
very, very, very uh, sympathetic to Merleau Ponty. He's he's one of the most underrated philosophers of the 20th century, in my opinion. I'm a big fan. Um, and so I, I agree with you on the bodily self awareness. So this kind of then bleeds into the other question, which is having a how, how does having a dream ego mean that you possess a body image? So we could maybe. I mean, you can talk about this in terms of what it means for humans, but my next leap is going to be, well, how would this happen for animals, right? Do mm -hmm. they have this sense of, does the octopus have a sense of their eight tentacles and all that? You know, how does this, how do, how do, how do we understand that, I guess, for, for animals? But maybe you want to start with yeah. humans first. No, I'll, let's just jump right in into the octopus. Um, okay. 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 <laughs> no need to ease in. Um, I, think, I think that's right, that in a dream, an octopus would have an implicit pre-thetic, pre-rational, pre-linguistic, et cetera, understanding of its own body, just like it does when it is awake. But how can and, we, but, okay, so, but how can we know that? Well, it depends on, it, it depends on distilling what we mean by body image. Um, okay. I don't, I don't mean that they have um, a mental image of their body, like a picture of what their body is that is separate from their... Mm -hmm. What I mean is simply that feeling, that, that raw sense of this is where the boundaries of my body are. Mm -hmm. This is where my body begins and ends. Mm -hmm. And based on the kind of body that I have, I can do certain things. I think that kind of body image, I think that term might be misleading, um, unfortunately, because it suggests something uh, much more psychological. That basic sense of the body, that feeling of, of embodiment mm -hmm. is necessary in any animal that, that has behavior. You, you cannot be an animal that survives in, in the wild, that achieves things, that hunts, that that swims, that runs, that flies, if you mm -hmm. don't have that very basic understanding of your body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think following Merleau-Ponty here is uh, the embodied aspect of things is important because it, let's say we could upload our consciousness to a, a computer server somewhere. That still would not be us. We need the body to complete the picture, right? There's only a part of us because our, our phenomenological ways of being in the world are through the body. It's through how that works, through sensation, through affect, through many of the things that we have in the body, and then is expressed back out through the body. There's so much of that that's there. And so I agree, right, where my body be end, or begins and ends is true for humans in terms of, you can think of things even as... as uh, neurological as proprioception. How do we know our space in the world, right? Yeah. Um, there's most certainly elements of that for, I would say, probably most organisms, especially other animals, that, right, how do I know <clears throat> to, you know, jump here, run here, not get eaten here, you know, look for this here, whatever. Um, I guess the difference then it always comes back to the you know prefrontal cortex right which is how much do they know that they know about that right that they know it is about this like there's probably a, a phenomenological piece of it otherwise how could they survive you could make that you could make that claim but do they know right are they having a, a an, an image of their mind you know in their mind's eye of their body probably not maybe but probably not but that doesn't mean that's required for this kind of phenomenological embodied state of what it means to be them, whatever that is. If you're flying, you have to have some sense of that. If you're running, if you're, you know, you know, you know, meters of <laughs> below the surface of the ocean, you have to understand some element in space. And so I could, I think that that argument holds, uh, I guess my question would just be, how much do they know that that's what it is? I don't know if it's required. But I'd be curious to know how much do they know about that of sorts. Yeah, so that that will definitely differ um, between species. There are some animals that we do have reason to believe have a really sophisticated psychological uh, sense of their body. So mm -hmm. earlier you mentioned uh, the mirror test. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Animals that pass the mirror test are able 
to alienate themselves from their own body image and relate to their body literally through an image of their body in the mirror, mm -hmm. right? So think about an orangutan that uses a mirror to analyze its teeth, mm -hmm. uh, which it's never seen directly before. Um, you know, not all animals pass that test, nor is the test um, free of limitations. Uh, there, there are a lot of good critiques of the mirror test, sure, sure. Um, including its, its um, oculocentrism, the fact that it focuses too much on vision, which might not be important for a lot of other animals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, from a phenomenological perspective, however, that second dimension of to what extent do they know that they have this mastery of their own body is less important than the first order question of the way in which they develop and maintain this mastery of the body um, directly before mm -hmm. turning it into an object of reflection. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, 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 I want to remain within that first dimension, although elsewhere I, I have written about the importance of that second dimension too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that you write about, I think one of the shorter chapters, so we can, we can just talk about it just kind of in a general sense is, where do you see the role of imagination here, and particularly imagination involved in cognitive mapping or, or some types of representation? How much do we understand the role of imagination uh, in, other, in other species, and especially when, it, when we are talking about dream states as well? Originally, imagination was not going to be a central term in my book. And as I went through writing all the different chapters, I came to the realization that I could not escape it, that I needed to write an entire chapter about it. And so chapter three on imagination was the, the odd one out uh, because it was the one that was not originally meant to be there. <laughs> uh, the original proposal to the press was a three chapter book mm -hmm. um, that would follow a certain structure. And then this one had to be introduced because I, I decided that it was important enough. And the reason for, for that change of, of plans has to do with the question, what ultimately is a dream? Mm -hmm. So when you dream, what kind of experience is that? Scientists and philosophers can't quite agree and there are different camps about how we ought to define dreams. Some people will say things like, well, a dream is basically a kind of thinking that happens when you are asleep. So it's like, like thinking or um, it's like believing. So that's the closest it is to. You often see this, um, view defended by philosophers of mind who have a training in analytic philosophy. Then there are people who say, no, 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 no. Dreams are more like hallucinations. That's what they really are like. They're hallucinations that happen during sleep because they share a lot of the, the phenomenological profile um, or the phenomenological properties of hallucinations. You know, they happen to us, we're not in control of them. As you said earlier, they're not volitional. We're kind of like victims of dreams in the same way that we are victims of hallucinations. And so we should understand dreams as a subspecies of a hallucinatory experience. Yeah. Other people say, no, 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 that's not right because there are also differences <laughs> between dreams and hallucinations. Hallucinations tend to focus on one sensory modality, but dreams usually include a lot more. They last longer. They, they are much more coherent than hallucinations. So they're not hallucinations. They are closer to imaginings. They are like acts of imagination. And th the debate rages on about what dreams are more like, you know, more like thinking, more like believing, more like hallucinating, more like imagining. In thinking about this question, I came to the view that all these experiences, um, hallucinations, imaginings, dreamings, um, but even other ones like daydreaming, when your mind wanders, when you're awake, that all of these can be 
brought under the umbrella term of the imagination, broadly understood. Because they all require the generation of something that is not there in the present. And so when I talk about imagination in, in the book, I, I defend the view that dreams do have a fundamentally imaginative quality. They activate the imagination. That's why we say um, in everyday um, speech that somebody's dream is a figment of their imagination. It's a child of the imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that captures something important about dreams. And if that's the case, if that's the interpretation that, that we feel comfortable with, then it raises questions about animals and their relationship to the imagination. And of course, historically, as, as you pointed out earlier, we have sought to police the boundary between the human and the non-human by presenting humans as the rational animal, as the thinking animal, the linguistic animal. Some people have, have policed that boundary along the lines of imagination. Humans are the imagining animal. We are the animal that can lift itself out of the shackles of the present, of the here and now, and think about something that is beyond. We can transcend immediacy, mm -hmm. and that's the function of the imagination. But if dreams really are a kind of imagining, as I believe that they are, then there is a kind of transcendence in the animal, in the dreams of other species, because it means that other animals can also generate mm -hmm. the irreal and supplant it in place of the real, especially um, during sleep. Mm -hmm. But if they can do that during sleep, this is where it opens to other phenomena, then maybe they can do that also when they are awake. Um, maybe animals can literally daydream. Um, maybe animals can simply imagine or think about things that are not there in their immediate environment. Maybe they think about where they were yesterday, or maybe they think about um, a cone specific that they encountered at some other time. Maybe they think about a different physical surrounding. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, it, I don't want to make too many definitive claims about the content of what other animals imagine. That's tricky business. It's it's probably not very good business. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the fact that that's a possibility, I think, is is put on the table, um, or at least I argue so in in my book, by what we now know about the dreaming capacities of other animals. And so that's why the question of imagination proved to be inescapable in yeah. this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very interesting chapter in the book. And so, I mean, I would agree. I mean, I think that <clears throat> dreams take an imaginative quality. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I think most people, if they've remembered their dreams, they everyone's had a weird dream. They've had a really like something out of a Salvador Dali painting, like some just wild, wild stuff in their dreams. So, I mean, that, that's not I don't find that hard to to really sit with. Maybe other people, I don't know who's making the claim that, I mean, I know people are, but it's just strange to me that this overemphasis on rationality is like, you know, that that's, dreams aren't that way. Dreams are, you know, it's it's like going to Willy Wonka's factory half the time. I mean, it's just <laughs> wild stuff in our dreams, right? So it doesn't make any sense. Stuff that like creeps us out. It's like, oh my God, how is that in my subconscious? Oh my goodness. So um, yeah, I definitely, I definitely, uh, that sits well with me. Uh, and in the last chapter, you talk about kind of the values of things. And so I just want to ask you here, you give a few few approaches here. You talk about the consequentialist approach to dreaming, the deontological approach, and then some of the moral view. So maybe just kind of give more philosophy, which which always pleases me. So maybe tell us <laughs> tell us these three different uh, kind of uh, different roads here. What, what, what are these about and how does it uh, impact dreaming? So in the last chapter of the book, I do a bit of a 180 because up until then I had I've talked about the science of dreams in chapter one, this the philosophy of consciousness in connection to dreaming in chapter two, and then the imagination in chapter three. Chapter four is in many ways the reason why I wrote this book. And that's where I turn to ethics and and morality. One thing that you said earlier that I think is important to bring back in 
is that when we open our minds to what the minds of other animals are capable of, it changes how we how we treat other animals. It changes how we see our relationship to them uh, on a moral register. And so in chapter four, I, I consider the ethical implications of the fact that other animals stream. Does this matter from a moral point of view? Now, there is very little research out there about dreams in connection to morality. Um, most of um, the wor- most of the 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 work that I found that bridges that gap is somewhat outdated in the sense that it 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 asks whether people are morally responsible for the creepy dreams that they have. Uh, you know, a lot of people worry if I have a if I have a sinful dream, am I sinning? Um, this mm-hmm. is, uh, for example, a major worry of Saint Augustine mm-hmm. in his Confessions, and a few other people have have raised similar questions. Are we responsible morally for our dreams? That's not the question that interests me. <laughs> the question that interests me is is not about the content of dreams and their relationship to to morality, but the fact of dreaming itself. Mm-hmm. And the way in which I access or enter this this question is through the concept of moral status. Moral status is a foundational concept in ethical and moral theory, and it refers to the property of having value as a moral agent, to being the kind of being that matters morally, and that therefore is entitled to some moral protections, right? To be treated with dignity, with respect, Mm -hmm. with care. That that they would have rights of sorts. Yes, some moral rights, depending Mm -hmm. on the animal, also maybe some legal rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've written about animal rights from from a legal perspective in another book, uh, here I focus more on moral entitlements. Mm -hmm. Um, So not treating somebody like a thing. Let's just Mm -hmm. put it Mm -hmm. that way. That's the simplest um, but accurate definition of moral status is being entitled not to be treated like a thing. Mm -hmm. And the connection to dreams here goes back to a question that you asked me about uh, 40 minutes ago. In one of the chapters, I make the argument that it is impossible for an animal to dream and to lack consciousness. Again, because there is just this essential logical connection between having a dream and, and having a kind of subjective feeling of being in a world. This is what is sometimes known as phenomenal consciousness having phenomena that are present to you as your objects, as the objects of your consciousness. Um, and especially experiences that that feel like something to you. Um, this is the very famous what it is like that we get from from Nagel, mm-hmm. uh, Thomas Nagel. Yeah. What is it? What is it like to be a bat? Okay. <laughs> exactly. What is it like to be a bat? Uh, mm-hmm. What is it like to be a psychedelic octopus having mm-hmm. a dream? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in moral theory, there is disagreement among experts about what gives somebody moral status. You know, if, if you're looking at all the kinds of beings and entities that exist in the world, how do you, how do you decide which ones should be objects of moral considerations and which ones should not be? Mm. You know, some entities are very easy, like we've never really worried about humans having moral status, although some humans have been denied uh, moral status Mm -hmm. uh, historically. Rocks have never really been granted moral status. That seems like an easy case. Animals is a a tricky case. You know, do they have moral status or not? Do they matter morally? To answer that question, you have to answer that preliminary one, which is what's the foundation? of moral status. And the two answers that are available to us are two of the main ones, rather, in in the history of Western moral theory Mm -hmm. are essentially reason. Reason entitles creatures to be treated with respect or a kind of basic feeling, um, phenomenal experience. 
being the kind of being that experiences pain and pleasure, so on and so forth. And so in the fourth and final chapter of the book, I, I make two arguments that build on one another. And so I'll try to say this just very quickly because we can get lost in the weeds here. Mm -hmm. The first one is that, again, dreams by definition are phenomenal experiences. It's, an, it's a subject in a phenomenal field mm -hmm. having an experience. Mm -hmm. And so to dream is to be a phenomenal logically conscious being. That's the first argument. The second argument, and this one is the intervention in moral theory, I argue, although there are people who disagree with this view, that the true foundation of moral status is phenomenal consciousness, that very basic sense of subjective awareness and feeling that doesn't require high-level cognition, language, or rationality. And so I, I disagree with some moral theorists um, of various allegiances of various camps who believe that in order to matter morally, somebody needs to meet a very high bar of cognitive functioning. And that doesn't sit well mm -hmm. um, with my own view of morality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, that that's super important. And that, that gets to, I think, the, the heart of it. Um, I, I, I have... I guess uh, two, two final questions here, which are kind of related and gets to what you're saying here, which is what can we say conclusively about dreams and animals? And what is the, you know, one or two things that you want readers to, to take from the book to say, yes, that's exactly what I was trying to say. You got what I was trying to say. And I have a feeling it's this very point that you're making, but uh, expand on that, I guess, a little bit of why this is important, what, what, we, what we can say about dreams and animals and why that's important in general and important for us and, and how it, it influences our potential relationships with, with animals on the planet. Mm -hmm. So in connection to the first question about what we can say, um, let's say with a high degree of conviction based mm -hmm. on the evidence that is available. So I, I want to mm -hmm. um, walk away from the notion of definitive uh, sure. just because that sets the bar very high. Sure. I think we can say that a lot of other animals stream. Uh, this includes mammals. This includes birds. This includes fish. This includes cephalopods. And on some views, it might even include insects. And so now we've caught in our theoretical net a pretty large swath of the animal kingdom. And that brings us very far away from the view expressed by the Spanish philosopher Santayana that I cite at the beginning of my book, according to which only humans dream. Santayana famously said, um, humans are the dreaming animal. Um, and I think by now that view is unsustainable, mm -hmm. at least if we want to be, um, at least if we take seriously the research that has been produced in not just the science of dreaming in the last century, but in the field of animal sleep research. Mm -hmm. um, given what these fields have put out, um, we now have to embrace a cross-species theory of dreams. Mm -hmm. We also know that the dreams of animals, again, have an effective component. Mm -hmm. um, even if, let's say, even if not all their dreams have an effective quality, if we want to maintain that distinction between affect and sensation that we tiptoed around earlier, mm -hmm. many of their dreams have clearly um, emotional content, mm -hmm. powerful emotional content. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about, but that I devote an entire section in my book is the case of animal nightmares. Mm -hmm. He says mm -hmm. where animals wake up in a panic mm -hmm. because they experience some, some really potent emotions like fear and anxiety in their dreams. And so dreams are not just internal movies that the animal mind plays for itself and that the animal watches like a passive bystander. They're realities that animals feel and live through with the core of their being. Mm -hmm. And so that's another thing that we know. 
The final thing that we know is that independently of what view you have about dream experiences, it's very difficult to talk about dreams and keep them neatly separated from other mental states. Mm. It's very hard to keep them separated from hallucinations, mm -hmm. from um, acts of thought. It's very difficult to separate them from imaginings, from daydreamings. And so once you start talking about dreams, this is an argument I make in chapter three, you really start talking about a whole spectrum of imaginative activity that mm -hmm. goes beyond dreaming. Mm -hmm. And so the implications of recognizing that animals stream spill over into other domains. So mm -hmm. I think those are the three things that I think we can say definitively about dreams. Mm -hmm. One, that other animals stream, that their dreams have extremely interesting emotional and effective um, components, hmm. and that they also are in, in dialogue with these other mental experiences. And that complicates um, and deepens, I think, our view of the animal mind. Hmm. Which brings us to the second question that you asked, which is what would I want readers to walk away from, ideally, um, in this book? And maybe that image of that visual vertical image of depth or deepening is, is a good one um, here, because I do think we need to consider the fact that the animal mind, and maybe we shouldn't use that term in the singular, that the minds of animals mm -hmm. have unexplored depths that we're mm -hmm. only now beginning to scratch. Um, dreaming is one of them. Uh, but there are many others. And so if I can make a contribution to making our views of the mental capacities of animals a little bit more complicated, um, then I, I think I, I have done my job successfully as a philosopher. You know, <laughs> philosophers, we're not in the business of answering questions. We, we're just in the business of giving people more questions to think about. <laughs> Um, so if, if that's <laughs> happened, I, I think I've done a good day's job. <laughs> yes, it's very true. Uh, every time I talk to a philosopher, um, we, we, we always end with, yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer to this question, but, you know, I'm just going to just, you know, throw it out there and, you know, make people think about it. And um, I always love those types of uh, conversations. Um, well, the book is called When Animals Dream. Uh, the Hidden World of Animal Consciousness. Uh, where can people find it? And where can people find you and on all of your great work? Well, people can find the book on the Princeton University Press website. They can also buy it on Amazon or with their favorite retailer. It is out at the very end of May, May 30th, May 31st. I'm not sure. Um, and and they can find me uh, over email. My email is David M. Pena, P E N A, at sfsu.edu. They can also find me on my own podcast, um, which is uh, Overthink. Uh, it's a philosophy podcast that tries to bring philosophy to a uh, broad and general public. Mm. And they can also find me on Twitter since I joined exactly two days ago, oh, finally caving uh -oh. in to, to, the uh -oh. <laughs> to the pressure to join the Twitterverse. Although I cannot give you my handle because I'm new enough to not actually remember <laughs> That's it. That's okay. <laughs> yes, yes, it's always a, uh, a love-hate relationship with Twitter, but um, all of that's great. Everyone check out his podcast, uh, buy his book. Uh, David, this is such a, such a fun conversation. I was really looking forward to it at the beginning, and I wish I could keep talking to you for hours and hours. You've been more than generous with your time. Um, I really, really, really enjoy uh, talking about this stuff and really thinking about these things. And I you know, can't say enough thanks to you for, for coming on and, and sharing all of your wisdom. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for having me. Of course.